food security and livelihoods while minimising the environmental footprint of rice production. But what do we mean by environmental footprint? In fact, I think in, in phase two we might change the wording a bit. So I think it's given Sarah a few sleepless nights trying to see how we can get good indicators of that. But basically it's looking at, given we've got a certain set of inputs, which are water, fertiliser, fuel, labour, etc. What are the issues if we have too high a use of these, of these particular inputs in terms of pollution, greenhouse gas emissions for example, lost biodiversity, health impacts? How much land would be needed to offset that, to balance that? And of course we need to take into account what are the beneficial outputs. So this is what the ecosystem services provided by rice production. And there we're looking at food production, obviously, and also the impact on livelihoods in the rural sector in those countries. And you've probably all seen over the, the past two months these banners, hopefully you've all seen them, the banners outside here at Erie. And these banners were initially, the idea was linked with the World Environment Day on June the 5th, but also in the whole of June in the Philippines is supposed to be the sort of the environmental month. And there was certainly a strong presence of, of um, Cory Gap associated with, with, with rolling out this, this story of promoting Erie's environmental stewardship. So we're promoting it, but we still know, want to know what are the indicators as to whether we're making good progress along these lines. And this is where Sarah comes in. And when Sarah began looking at this in 2013, and she had some meetings with our colleagues from different countries, I think there are over 50, I think Sarah, different indicators that were identified in these different workshops. It's now been collapsed down to 12. And this is part of the Sustainable Rice Platform and the initiatives with the United Nations Environment Program. And of those 12, there are certainly some on the social aspect, such as women's empowerment, where well, we are getting some indication of data on that, but worker health and safety and child labour, and to a degree food safety, they're not issues that we really are monitoring that closely. But when it comes to the other indicators, these are ones that we are certainly very interested in. We're looking at, the, as Matty says, triple bottom line, so the economic, social and environmental aspects of sustainability. And it's these indicators that now we're trying to see how we can, or what sort of data is required to be able to give us a good measure of how we're tracking from an environmental perspective. And so with Corrigap, there's been quite a lot of effort on the research farm here over the last two years. And that provides a sort of baseline survey data and on the on-farm experiments also then enables to validate what is happening with those different indicators and perhaps what we're not measuring or which we cannot measure at the moment. And then at landscape level, this is mainly on-farm and so at a field level and at landscape level we're looking at impacts on water and soil quality. One of the indicators that wasn't shown in those 12 indicators is biodiversity. And this is something which is interesting. We're talking to one of our colleagues from Kellogg, who was very much involved with SRP. When we're saying, OK, are we ready to roll out a biodiversity indicator? The answer is probably not yet. We don't really know specifically are the indicator species, what are the things we should be measuring. But the point he made was it's so important to show that at least we are beginning that process. Because public, public perceptions they want to know, are we treating biodiversity seriously or not? And so we've had a project with a PhD student, um, Richard, who I think some of you would have come across over the last three or four years. He's currently writing up. And he was looking at the bird communities in the Philippines, looking at AWD versus continuous flooding. And also during his PhD, there was an initiative by the government of the Philippines to look at trying to grow in certain areas five crops in two years. And so he looked at where, what was happening, what did that mean in terms of the bird communities, where you had two crops per year versus five crops in two years. 
that data has still been analysing, analysed, and certainly Alex and I, who we supervisors, would be very keen to see that come out in the next six months. We're also um, Bu Yong and his group are building on work from Kaylee Yong and um, from Finbar Horgan in looking at predator guilds of insect pests and the responses to pesticide use. And there's some work on amphibians. And with amphibians, we've, we have linked with Northern Arizona University with Professor Catherine Proper and her PhD student, Molly, who was here for a couple of months recently. We'll be back again in the next couple of years from using from about May through to August during the monsoon season. And she's interested in looking at amphibians as indicators of pesticide effects on, on the aquatic physiology of amphibians. What is it? Uh, can we get measures on variables that drive the amphibian biodiversity and abundance within the rice paddies? And also, are the amphibians also effective consumers of rice paddy pests? So, should we look at the diet of the, the different, different uh, frogs and toads? With this here, most of that work will be done on the tadpoles, where we get a much clearer measure of what's happening. And there's Molly, and so you'll probably run across her next year. Understanding the key players and the factors involved in the value chain. So it's a few slides on that and give you a flavour. And so I'm trying to give you a flavour of what we're doing. And the Learning Alliance. This is work's been led by um, Martin Gummet and Rien Kaloy. And they've been looking at using this approach, decision analysis approach, which brings in together different actors in the value chain. So it looks at support use of technologies, what are the best management practices and its adoption, and it's looking at how we can have joint learning across the different stakeholders. So those stakeholders would include not only the farmers and also government officials, but also millers, traders, and, um, and yeah, millers, traders and different types of traders. So you've got export traders and local traders. So it's an iterative process, it's flexible and adaptable, and we're looking at targeting change. So we're going, we're going for a planning process, what is the actions that will can overcome certain identified um, blockages in terms of progress, reflect and capture that, and then go through that process again. And we've been implementing this in Myanmar, in Vietnam, and in Thailand, and in different contexts. In Myanmar, it's something which Martin has done before in, in, um, with, in Cambodia, for example, with an ADB project, where it's focusing primarily on some of the post-harvest aspects. And so that has, has proved quite successful. But here in Vietnam and Thailand, you try to apply that Learning Alliance approach where they're thinking more about issues to do with sustainability and sharing of resources. So it was, it was quite a learning exercise and something which is ongoing. Matty and Peter have been looking at analysis of the value chain in Vietnam and for those who sat in on Matty's talk yesterday um, during the Board of Trustees meeting, then um, I decided I didn't need to have too many slides because Matty gave an excellent overview yesterday. But basically talking at the the rice value chains, the Mekong Delta, and they are changing rapidly at the moment, particularly in terms of the, the, the presence of service providers. And the, the, at national level, the Vietnamese government are now focusing on quality rather than quantity and seeing what that means in relation to the export market. And looking, they're also interested in what are the changing or the factors that may influence um, the feedback in relation to the domestic consumption. What are the, what are the people preferring in terms of their purchase of rice? And how this all links to sustainability. And this is sort of a, a, sort of a summary slide of, of a lot of work. And one of the questions that have been asking is, can other stakeholders benefit from sustainable farming practices? So if we work closely with farmer, with farmer cooperatives and farmer groups, and they are adopting what we see as best practice, which is also environmentally sustainable, or sustainable in terms of, of, of um, income. 
then we can see that, yes, exporters see benefit in controlling production processes and empowering farmers. And the international local consumers are demanding sustainable practices. On the other side of the equation, in terms of what we need to think about a bit more, is the, the there's a more the, how we can get a greater focus on high quality, particularly with the farmer groups, and how whether the farmer groups can get paid a premium for having that focus. The health and safety aspects of what is being marketed. And it's interesting, traceability is something which has been demanded by consumers. And that's something which now is happening in uh, Thailand, where they start to introduce the, um, they can just do a little quick scan, and you can get an idea of where the rice is, it was um, grown. But it's still a very early stage. And supermarkets are, seem to be the drivers of change, and there's a familiarity. Um, once the consumers become more familiar with products, then they understand more about what's happening. And there's some information too in terms of Mackie and Peter trying to understand what are the consumers willing to pay in terms of their premium price for these, these better products. So, where next? We want to run up activities at a, a new site in Myanmar. So, at the moment, we, there's um, Sadir and uh, Romy Kabangan and Yomi Twe are over and looking at this site and planning for the next field season. We want to still continue this marriage of ecological footprint and closing the yield gaps. So, we're trying to see how we can use the, the field calculator. Um, and, uh, and also, how we can get the field calculator to be used by our partners. And there was a workshop held just two weeks ago uh, here at URI, and we had participants from six of the countries that we work with looking at that. We want to document some success stories, particularly as happening in South Sumatra, Guangdong, and Kentu. This is a busy slide because Sarah will be very busy over the next 18 months or 15 months through to the end of phase one. So I won't go through it too much in terms of detail, but you can see that now we have these indicators pretty well described, the 12 indicators of which nine of those we're going to get data upon. Then it's a matter of going and looking at, at collecting that data, um, looking at further development of the field calculator and also the work that she's doing, it really does, it's just um, at a stage now where we, we, we'd be begging, begging to be published because the overview, the advances that are happening here, does put us ahead of the game, particularly in terms of the rice systems. Us, I mean, here. Sustainability of the food value chain, um, the work that, that Matty and um, Peter will be involved with looking at a set of sustainability metrics and develop those, um, fine tune those, identify the governance systems that internalise the incentives uh, for, for sustainability, promoting these governance systems and looking at gender equity as part of the social sustainability and seeing how that can link through to the value chain level. So this is just a really brief snapshot of some of the activities that they'll be doing through until the end of phase one. And as I mentioned, documentations of key findings are so important. And I come across this quote, and sometimes it rings a bit too true. If we think about squirrels, autumn's coming, where can I bury the work that I've been doing? And so we'll have to do better than the squirrels, and we're paying to do so with our publications. And we've already had a number of publications come out this year, and next year will be an opportunity to consolidate that approach. We have an external review of phase one, and that will happen in December. So the review team will be here uh, on December the 1st and 2nd. And um, it's... Um, um, Karen Baroga is probably known to many of you. She's with Phil Rice and she's in development communication. She's one of the reviewers. And Ian Willett um, from Australia is the second reviewer. And Ian Willett has a background in, in water and agronomy and soil. 
that review team will report back in February at our next annual meeting um, in, in Job Jakarta. And that, after we get that report, then STC will invite us to develop the second phase. But STC has already budgeted for a second phase. And the second phase is about $5 million. And so we are at a stage now of thinking and developing that. And we had, say, two weeks ago, a two-day workshop here before the other workshop where we had our collaborators and we're starting to think about, okay, what should we, would be the way ahead for phase two. So we're at this very, very early stage of our thinking for phase two, which is another four-year project from 2017 to 2020. And I wanted to emphasise that you know, this is a, the team of players that we've got in phase one. Obviously, they've done an excellent job and we're looking to carry it through into phase two. But if anyone's interested in... in, a, in um, getting involved in phase two, like Bert Collard has already made it very clear that he would like to see that, you know, what are the particular varieties being used in our main uh, hubs and study sites and can he help us advise on whether we, perhaps we can improve upon that. So it's very important to get that sort of input and feedback. So in conclusion, we've had strong progress across a very, very diverse array of disciplines. We've had excellent buy-in by our NAS partners, and that led to strong local champions in each country, and it's just so essential for the sort of project that we're doing. The early results and reduction in yield gaps are exciting, but we still need to understand more about what is leading to these yield gaps. And that's where the socioeconomic approach, what Maddie is, is working closely now with, with Alex, to see if they can disentangle that from the data that we already have. Impressive progress towards ecological sustainable production. I can't overemphasize by having these set of clearly defined indicators, it's, we're well, well advanced than what we were two or three years ago. Promoting engagement of more of the actors via the Learning Alliance is, is a, a key to see how we engage more, with the, particularly with the private sector, but also with government, government partners, the extension, the um, scientists in country. An impressive progress exploring the rice value chain, the work that Peter and, and Matthew are doing, and we're well positioned for phase two in the next, well, from 2017 onwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Grant, for a great overview on the Curry Gap project. Uh, does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? aspects of the project is, the, is bringing the, the field calculator uh, to, the, to the table to enable um, users to, to pre-test uh, various recommendations. So if we look at the, sort of the possible clients going from you know, researchers, extension leaders, um, managers, up to, up to policy makers, where, where do you think there's a real interest in Um, yeah, it's, it's a good question, and certainly we've had a lot of interest from our, our counterparts in country, and they part of the interest is they see not only does it help with um, when it comes to working with our extension counterparts and training of trainers, but also they see it as can provide, particularly that's the spider diagram approach, provides a picture which policymakers can absorb. So it provides, it brings that together in a, in, a, in a format which is so important to be able to present to the policy makers. So I think it's at all those different levels. Now when I'm answering these questions I'll be looking across to the other people involved in Corriga because the whole idea was this, this presentation is to give you an introduction for, of what we've been doing over the last two or three years and hopefully open up opportunities for discussion with the various people who are involved in the different aspects of what we're doing. Not today, but in the next few months. Any other questions? Uh, 
Brent, a very nice overview. Um, something I might have missed, but what are the biggest agronomic sort of interventions that seem to be really having a big impact on you know reducing yield gaps? Is there something specific? I mean, I know there's a lot of things that seem to uh, adding up together, but I'm I'm really curious about what management has you know what what effect that has had and and you know where you see it going. Okay, so one of the, the clear messages that we had from the donor is that they didn't want to see um, component technologies. So that was IRRC, where we had different work groups that we were looking at fertilizer management, looking at water management, pesticide, or pest management, etc. So they wanted to look at a situation where we're bringing together the, the best practices. And that's what we've been doing. But so we're doing that within the, the national scheme. So we're looking at one must do five reductions, for example, in Vietnam. One must do is quality seed. Um, the reductions is the amount of seed, is the amount of pesticide, the amount of fertilizer. The, well, in fertilizer, it's more the, the timeliness of its application. Um, the amount of water use and also the post-harvest losses. That's what they're trying to reduce. But looking at that, we're also seeing within that particular set, what else can we add? And so one of the, there's, well, there's two initiatives, for example, has come out of Martin Gummett's group, um, not so much for Vietnam, but for the other countries. One is solar bubble dryer. So that's a, a new initiative. It's something which is, is, um, has certainly um, generated lots of interest in, in Myanmar and also in um, South Sumatra, in Kalimantan. And also there's this, particularly when they're looking at um, in Vietnam and elsewhere, the consolidation in the small farm or large fields is use of laser leveling. And so they're things that we would add to that. But if you're looking at, at places like South Sumatra or um, in the Awai Delta in Myanmar, there they're not ready for that sort of technology as yet. So just using the, the drum seeder, because labour is one of the major um, factors that we come up wherever we inter interview farmers, the, the cost of labour. And so where they've been transplanting in the past, they're converted to direct seeding, finding out lots of problems with weeds and, and other things and pests in general. And so the drum seeder is a good compromise for them. And in fact, in Thailand, they've now, the our farmer group there is is mechanised the drum seed that they put it on the back of a, a tractor and they're dragging it along. So it's, it's some of those practices that we're trying to add to what is already recognised um, as being the best practice, but seeing how we can add again to that. And it's, it's looking at those opportunities. But certainly, just even when there are best practices, when you look at GAP, if you ask the farmers, yes, we're rolling out best practice, but when we then implement what we see as being what fine num gm we're still getting this increase in profit. So it's and there is some analyses that, that can be done as underway at the moment where we can try and um, hold certain factors constant and see which one could be contributing the most to the yield gap differential. And that's where we we've got the data set there and there we're going to compare the top 10% or maybe the top 20 percentile with what's happening with the other farmer groups and what are they doing differently? And that analysis is underway. <coughs> Grant, this is uh, related. I was just interested in the, in the slides showing the yield gaps. And in Indonesia, the significantly higher level of, of uh, achievement by the best farmers compared to even some of the other sites that were on the slide. Way of accounting for a significant, significantly higher level. I'm looking at Alex here. Um, certainly, in, in some of these these places too, we have taken into account that the farmers will have another source of income, and so some farmers will, will be spending more attention, where others just sort of just put the seed in and walk away and do the minimum amount. But yeah, we're we're trying to understand that. There's a huge yield gap, huge variation across fields in the same small location. Uh, some of the reasons could be uh, the, the 
different crop they're planting in the third season. Some are growing a third rice crop, some, some are growing maize or legumes. Uh, there's a huge variation in inputs, in fertilizer use especially. Um, and the field sizes range, and, and they're quite small field sizes, so that could have a big effect on the conversion of uh, the yield. Um, so, we, COGAP goes into the country and looks at the national programs such as one, one must do five productions. Does, do, do we then take, if we see something missing from the best practice, do we then take that technology and then what sort of opportunities are there to sort of influence? We obviously have very quick um, connections in the national program. So, how, how, how does COGAP influence? No, well, that's precisely what we do do. So, um, and certainly like the post-harvest is an interesting one, and I'm sure Martin could, could talk a fair bit about that, but it's also looking at, you know, what are the opportunities, and given the current practices, and what are they missing out on? Now, something like Myanmar, obviously, is a, it's quite an open book. So there, um, we're bringing across the technologies, and so um, Donna has been involved with work in the Mekong in the um, Awadi Delta with a, a, a UN funded project. Um, Romy um, Labis is over there as well. And so there it's, it's like when Donna first went there, she had all these plans to, to roll stuff out and the first question she had, they had was, weeds are a big issue, what do we do? And we didn't know what, what weeds they were, I think. So they spent just a season trying to characterize that. And so it does depend you can't sort of be, um, that's the adaptive research, is that we are responding to what the needs are. So they have a best practice at a national level. Uh, Indonesia, for example, have this integrated crop management, which is this thick, their booklet. Um, but a lot of the action is focused on um, varietal quality and integrated pest management. And that's basically it. And so we're trying to promote things like alternate wetting and drying, water management, and, and um, Roland has been very much involved in other work looking at, at trying to promote the, the rice crop manager in terms of fertiliser, the timing of use. And Roland's now working with Veranda in Sri Lanka to see how we bring that in as well. Uh, Grant, thanks very much for that presentation. Uh, we see in Corrigo formally with IRRC leading into that. Very good NARS, NARI's partnerships that have been cultivated. We look at Cure and we see the consortium and we see a very good set of partnerships that have been built over the years with national governments, different divisions, etc. Strasser, we have uh, a different type of model but a very good relationship in terms of uh, investments by government, etc. Then we have a project like CESA where we're, we've finished two phases and the whole engagement of partnerships in moving forward has, has struggled tremendously. These are all examples within the one institute. And I was wondering, how do we as an institute, uh, suggestions and maybe David wants to comment, learn from each other so that best practices are able to be moved we're able to use better practices, have more chances of success, etc. as we move forward. Open questions. Yeah, and I think it's a very good question. And we've thought about that a fair bit. Now, one of the advantages, I suppose, of coming into, say, a consortium that's been going for, well, when I first arrived, been going for, for eight years, um, nine years, 